I'm curious, like what your thoughts are about just like measurement overkill versus getting the right amount of stuff. Is that kind of individual to the athlete when you're working with them too, to some degree, or is there a point, is there, is there a point where you're like, okay, I need a little more data than this, regardless of how like relaxed you want to be or versus another one person who like, you can't get off a of Strava and is <laughs> hyper watching their heart rate and pace and all of the other stuff on the, on their, on their watch and whatnot. Yeah. You know, there's two things that come to mind. First is we pay attention to what we measure. Mm -hmm. So whatever it is we're measuring, we're going to give attention and value to it. So that means like, even if the measure is useless, we're still going to pay attention to it because like we're measuring it. So to me, that means be very deliberate and intentional on what you're measuring and making sure that it provides actual value, not just value because you're doing it. And the other thing I'd say on this, like over measuring on, I think it's highly individual. And to me, it comes back to, it's almost like, does the measurement create anxiety or dependence, right? So <laughs> for instance, I'll give the example. With athletes, if I told you to go run, uh, let's say we're going to run mile repeats, and I said, give me your watch. For some, re for some athletes, they'd be like, okay, fine. I don't need my watch. I'm not going to be precise, but I'll run these in 530, right? And I'll be in the ballpark. Another athlete, if, if you take away their watch, they'll be like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, I can't do this. I need my watch. I had one, one female athlete who literally, I said, you know, put your watch to the side. She takes it off and then hides it in her short pocket. And, <laughs> and then I like see her pull it out like halfway through the rep to check her pace. And I'm like, oh my gosh. But that, that gives you an indicator of like how much like anxiety is built from mm -hmm. having the watch or not. And what we want is like, you know, probably some in that middle road where it's like someone, sure, it feels a little bit weird taking your watch off, but it's not the end of the world. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for other metrics. Like if you become so dependent on it that it creates anxiety when you don't have it, then you probably need to go in the other, other direction. Now on the flip side, when do you measure things? Well, when it provides valuable information that impacts your coaching or training. So if, if you have someone who, for example, is horrible at maybe getting sleep or like pushing them too hard well then something like hrv might be a good reminder of like okay i see my hrv dropped and this athlete says oh it's because i only got four hours of sleep and when i get eight hours of sleep my hrv is is better or whatever the score is better <laughs> so i guess i should make that behavioral change what you're getting there is the importance isn't the hrv or not it's does it lead to the behavioral change that mm -hmm. is desirable? And I think that's how we look at and utilize measurement systems is like, does it lead to positive adaptation or does it create that dependency and anxiety that often like leads to negative adaptation? Yeah, no, it makes sense. I have a, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, my wife, she doesn't train with a watch or use a watch at all. Uh, and she's just gotten, I mean, she has in the past, she's been running for 30 years. So it's like her understanding of efforts across the spectrum is so precise. It's funny. I'll go out and do a workout with her sometimes and just like, just tell her kind of what we should be targeting. And then I'll kind of like, I won't like pace it so that I can see if she's like how accurate she can get. And it's like, it's pretty phenomenal to the point, like, I mean, she's doing ultra marathons, which I think is a little more, I mean, perceived effort is probably even more valuable and a event that has that long of duration because there's so many things go wonky in terms of the data feedback yes. you're going to get when you're like beyond three hours and things like that. And, but for her, it's like, it kind of simplifies that process to a degree because she just knows like at the start of a race, it doesn't really matter who goes out at what pace, because I know what it feels like to run for 10 hours in a sustainable way versus 15 hours, whatever it happens to be. And she can just tune that up because it's so finely tuned from just years and years of practice of that. Um, but it was interesting because during the pandemic, when all the races were canceled, she's like, well, I think maybe I'll just train for a marathon for the fun of it. Cause it's different. It'd be good to get some speed work in my legs before picking kind of whatever race is next. And then it got to a point where it's like, yeah, I could probably use a little bit of data here and there. And I was like trying to guide her. So I'm like, yeah, I could use some of that data too to help kind of steer the direction as to what we do next or how we do things. 
You know, I love that because it's like use the data when it's useful. And then like when you feel good about it, like you don't have to. And the other thing I'd point out there is that your wife's ability, like it is a skill that we all can develop. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's often missing is it's not like she woke up and is magically in sync and knows the effort levels for whatever ultra pace or race or what have you. It's that she trained it by listening to her body for a really long time. And if we over rely on the data, what that does, it, you know, is it prevents that, that learning and understanding. So that's why, you know, whenever I was coaching uh, college athletes, one of my favorite things to do was to send people out for a tempo run without a, without a watch is like an indicator of how well does this person understand how to run by feel? And you'd say, Hey, go run this effort or this pace. And if they were wildly off, that tells you like, okay, this person needs to train like that feeling and learn what it feels like. If someone's relatively close, you can say like, okay, like they're kind of like your wife. They can dial yeah. in at this effort. Like it's not a big deal. The watch isn't going to get in the way or the data isn't going to get in the way that much because like they've already developed and honed this skill. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. I think um, when I'm, when I'm coaching athletes one thing i always try to share with them early on is like let's see if we can get perceived effort to be your like your most reliable guide and we're going to use these other tools to help you understand that better if you don't know it already so it's like using heart rate and like pace over duration for like a controllable environment and things like these are all great data points that I like to move to post-workout eventually so that it's something we can reflect on and kind of tease out where that stuff is. But I always feel like we've accomplished something when I can send out an athlete for like a threshold run or something like that. And it, it, even if they have a watch on, they look at it and they just, it predicts they're going what they are supposed to do and they could just tune out to it if they needed to and be just fine. You know, I love that. And I think you're spot on. And you know, I was really fortunate in some ways, unfortunate in others, but like when you grow up outside of Houston, Texas, and you run in the summer when it's hot, humid, and horrible, yeah. <laughs> what happens is all your data points go out the window. Mm -hmm. So I remember in high school, we'd, we'd, you know, have some sort of like steady run. And if we looked at our watch, we'd be like 30 seconds a mile yeah. slower than when it's cool. And all you do is you get depressed. So you'd mm -hmm. stop looking at your watch and then you'd be like, oh, I'll look at my heart rate. Well, you look at your heart rate and it starts out normal, but because of the humidity and your body inability to cool itself, like by the end, it's like near max, even though mm -hmm. you're going steady. So you had to force yourself. It almost like forced you to like hone that perceived effort. And I think that. You know, hopefully you don't have to deal with the crazy heat and humidity, but giving yourself some room to do that is great. And then utilize the data afterwards, as you said, as that feedback, that learning mechanism where you say, okay, this is information. It's not the dictator. And I think that's the key. Yeah, it was, it's funny. I, you know, I grew up in the Midwest, lived in Wisconsin. That's where I ran high school and college uh, track and cross country. And it was like clockwork every fall when the humidity would break, everyone's running 15 plus seconds a mile faster. And like you, you, in high school, it's like, you might knock a minute off your 5k time and yeah, everyone's like, Oh, wow. I just like hit this nice new level of fitness. Like, no, you know, you just got a better environment and it, it happened. It's, I know it's not linear, but it's a little more linear than that. <laughs> you know, I love that. My high school coach after I was done said the same thing is, you know, the best thing about cross country is you go from horrible, humid, you know, miserableness. And then once the weather breaks, it's like you get that PR yeah, and because all the kids are like, the workouts are working. Yeah. Look how much faster we get, you know, and you assign it to the work when in reality it's like, oh, the weather. But what that does is it gives you that confidence, you mm -hmm. know, and, and you, you go into the championship season being like, I'm peaking perfectly. And it's like, nah, man, the weather got better. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a perfect, like, yeah. it's a perfect spotlight on the, just the level of the level that just confidence and motivation actually plays into performance almost above and beyond a lot of this other stuff that like we think are very, very based in science. And it's like, obviously that stuff's important too, but like just the fact that like you just, you always, I remember this, like it was yesterday, like you'd hit that new standard 
And then you didn't run slower than that going forward because in your mind, you like, you had unlocked that that was achieved. It was no longer this brick wall that you couldn't get through. And like so much of that, I mean, obviously the weather is a play in that specific example, but I wonder how much improvement is also after that point too. just like having that confidence boost of knowing like, Oh, when I do this work, I get this result leads to just like, you know, more PRs down the road when you've renormalized where your, where your potential is at. I think that normalization process is so important and not talked about enough. And, and we all like, we've all gone through it, right? Mm -hmm. Like (laughs) whether it's the high school, college afterwards, post-collegiate, what happens is you raise that standard and all of a sudden what's fast and what's like slow changes. It's almost Mm -hmm. like that, that what is hard changes. Yeah. Well, so does what, what's fast and slow and what happens is all of a sudden, you know, and sometimes it's like within a couple of weeks, you know, you're running mile repeats at five minute pace. And then all of a sudden your idea of slow and fast changes. And, and now 450 is normal and five minutes feels slow. Mm-hmm. And you'd be like, oh, I'd never run slower than this anymore. <laughs> and, and, you know, my athletes uh, would often tell me that they almost, you know, one of them called it like the floor gets higher right? Mm -hmm. Because they're like, you know what, if I show up on race day, and even if I feel horrible, like I still can run this because that's not that fast. And I think that's such an important shift mentally that occurs that allows us to kind of, you know, perform up to our capabilities. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Like when your bad days are still pretty good relative to your norm, then that's a level of confidence that's hard to match. (laughs) It, it, exactly it is and on the flip side though this can sometimes get in the way so for instance um when you when you set a goal that is you know maybe difficult but it, it's it's kind of challenging to get to sometimes it comes a barrier because you've set up the standard of like this is fast right and we'll, we'll use it maybe you you say like uh, a three hour marathon. You're like, this is fast. This will get me to Boston or what have you. And you chip away, chip away. And you end up not getting it because in your mind, it's still fast. Right. Mm. And part of training is convincing yourself that like that three hour marathon, like, yeah, it's hard, but like, it's not actually that fast. Like I'm capable of this. And this is where we, we want to make sure that like our goals and our perception of like what's fast or slow or what have you is working with us and not serving as a roadblock that, you know, works against us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And it's, uh, it's just like you're, you're, you always learn the more you do it and some lessons you relearn and relearn and relearn or just need reminders of them every, every season, it seems. It, exactly. I mean, we're, we're hard headed. So even, and I've been running for, you know, years and I still make some of the same bonehead mistakes that, that, you know, I shouldn't, but that's because we're human. 